So this is lecture 11 of ECE uh, 503. Okay, so in this lecture, we're going to start off with, you know, the, the, the amazing topic. And I, I think a good chunk of this course is dedicated to, to this specific type of um, construct, this type of tool. I like to think of this as a very powerful tool that we all will use some point in our careers, which is called filters. All right? So um, in particular, we're going to look at LTI systems that we're going to use as filters. And filters are surround, surround us every day, right? Like, you know, and, and let's say not even, not even from an electrical engineering standpoint, right? Like water filters, right? Um, um, but, like, but, but filters uh, all have the same sort of implication, that we extract some information that's desired, just like we want to extract something from the water supply, which is the clean water, right? And reject other things, like, you know, my water supply might want to reject the iron in the water, right? So, filters in this case, so frequency selective filters, what we're trying to do here is essentially design LTI systems that do this wonderful process of extracting specific types of information, specific type of signal information from a transmission keeping it and rejecting the rest. What we'll see is that there's actually five basic types of filtering operations. There's low pass filter, there's high pass filter, there's band pass filter, there's band stop, and there's all pass. Okay? Each one has a specific characteristic and what we're going to look at in this lecture is really um, sort, of the, sort of like um, a very simple perspective, the ideal filter design, okay? Because we want to see conceptually what to do. Later on, we're going to have a lot of fun later in this class designing real world filters. Because what we're going to look at here is like, oh, really? Like, you know, ideally you have this signal coming in and reject the rest. In real world, you don't get that. And that's where the engineering comes in. So we have these five different types of filters. And as the name implies, right? So low pass filter. The low pass filter passes uh, frequency content of a signal that's surrounding DC and there's a cutoff at minus omega C to omega C. So I'm only letting information surrounding DC, right, to pass through at zero hertz or zero, zero omega, right, Z omega equals zero, and not let the high frequency components pass through. The high pass is the exact opposite of the low pass. Essentially, only the high frequency components are allowed to pass and the low are rejected. From, the, uh, from passing through. Band pass, I'm only taking specific narrow portions in between the high frequencies and low frequencies and rejecting everything else. Band stop is actually pretty cool. Band stop does the exact opposite. Band stop is like, I'm going to let everything else except these little slivers in between high frequencies and low frequencies. And then my favorite, um, the all pass, like the all spark, right? The all pass. Um, it's an interesting uh, filter because it lets all the frequencies go through, but the phase response is actually kind of unique. If you want to manipulate the phase response of a signal, you use the all pass. So it'll let the magnitude response be the same, but I want to change the phase response slightly. Use an all pass, right? Everything else manipulates both phase and magnitude response. Uh, all pass, only the phase. Yes? So for instance, um, so for instance, like I had a PhD student and they were playing with, um, I actually had several PhD students, so there are several projects and they always encountered a situation where they have a signal um, that they want to play with, but the problem is is that um, the signal itself has, um, again, like this idea of nonlinear phase. So the phase response of that signal is very messy, right? So it might be nice you know, to, in order to treat that signal or to use it later on in another subsequent process, I might apply um, a, a different phase, right? I might want to introduce um, something like a frequency selective phase change to the entire signal. Because let's say that phase response is nonlinear. It's like all over the place. It's gobbledygook. And I want to modify it to make it much more simple that, such that my computations later on can actually modify it, right? Uh, to use it. So what I would do is pass it through an all-pass filter. Um, it would pass through it. Magnitude response will be the same. 
But, oh, lo and behold, it now has a linear phase response, which is much more easier to play with than, let's say, something that's like all over the place. So really, if you have a signal that has a very complex phase response and you want to simplify it, you would use one of these guys. Does that answer your question? And let's say you have an audio signal, so you can hear. When you change the phase response of it, does it change? Uh, so audio, uh, in human audio, you don't, you don't really hear phase. I might be wrong. I should double check. But uh, in human audio, the, the, the ear doesn't pick up phase changes. Like you should try, actually try it out with, let's say, like create your own tone, right? And then change the phase on it. You won't, you won't hear anything. The, uh, the, I be, let, I'll double check. That's a good question. But I believe in like audio and speech communications and such, like the human hearing doesn't pick up the, the phase change. But in like wireless communications and other applications, Phase definitely does play a very significant role. But I want to double check that. So don't take my word for it until I double check, OK? OK, awesome. All right. So um, you know the frequency response. So this guy here, so th what we see here, this is exactly what I was talking about. In fact, that's actually a great question about you know, why do we play with um, uh, all pass filters, and uh, why do we care about playing with the phase response? And, and the reason is, is that we might want to simplify the signal. We might want to modify it to fit some sort of specific target application or so. And what you have here, this guy here, this uh, H of omega, this is an oversimplification of, of a filter. In this case, what we've got, this is a low-pass filter. And this low-pass filter is non-zero. So between, uh, actually it's not even low pass filter, it could be anywhere. But between omega 1 and omega 2, so some frequency range, it's non-zero. Everything else is zero. So remember, actually, so let's go back. So remember this guy? So what this do guy does is the following. So suppose he looks like this, right? And suppose he is like minus omega 2 and omega 2. But uh, let's say the, uh, and, and suppose that, like, you know, we, there's some bad stuff introduced. Let's say there's this guy here and there's this guy here, right? I don't want that. So what I do? What I do is this guy, I design him. In this case, what I can do is I can do a low-pass filter. It's, so there's some shorthand. LPF means low-pass filter. So if you ever see, oh, what's the LPF? What's the coefficients of the LPF? Low-pass filter, all right? And so what I can do is I can design a guy. He might have some sort of you know, magnitude C. Uh, he might have a phase, like E to the J omega, right? And he also is from minus omega 2 to omega 2. So what happens when I multiply these two guys together? These guys get multiplied with 0. And so the output end up with what I'm desiring, which is just this triangular waveform. Correct? And so that, that expression that I drew on the other side, this time I'm going to discard. Ha, ha, ha. So this guy, this expression, is essentially that. This guy here, oh, the mouse is really twitchy. So this expression over here um, represents that. So you have a constant uh, magnitude, and you have some sort of phase, right? And it's applied across um, a frequency range from omega 1 to omega 2, and it's otherwise 0. And so, as a result, like we can design any one of those band pass, band reject, uh, all pass, uh, low pass, high pass filters using this technique. But uh, as we'll see later on, in reality, we can't really make these types of filters. You know, to get a perfect square wave. Nah. So, because what what is what is the what is the inverse Fourier transform of a of a rectangular wave? It is a sync pulse. In order to have a perfect uh, rectangular wave your sync pulse needs to range from minus infinity to infinity. And that's 
that kind of takes up a lot of resources. So you can't really do that. So we're, that's why later on in this course we'll explore other less ideal filters that are, in my, my personal opinion, and whenever I do home improvements, the same thing, good enough, right? So I mentioned this before, this guy. And so what ends up happening is, um, you know, we can use um, those types of filters in order to do treatment like what I just showed, like reject um, tones and such. And there are other very specific types of filters which I'm about to show you. Um, but just before uh, we continue, there is a very important uh, uh, term that I want to bring up. And again, that refers to the question about uh, why do we care about phase? And I, then I mentioned linear phase. And the, 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 really the gist of it all is um, what happens is when we introduce a phase, it's a type of delay, right? When we have a phase, um, you know, with ideal filters, we, we have some sort of delay element that's introduced into our system. And what we really, really, really want, so I mentioned this before, like in, in my answer regarding if we had um, a phase response across frequency that's nonlinear and stuff, that is really messy. What, I, what we all ideally want is a phase response that's linear, because when it's linear phase characteristic, this guy here, what we can then do is have something called a group delay. The group delay is the first order derivative of the linear phase characteristic. And what the group delay tells me is this is how much delay is in oper uh, your system, right? And it's a constant number. So as long as I can have my, my linear phase characteristic like, uh, or I can have my, uh, my, uh, my phase represented as linear, and then I do this first order derivative with respect to omega, I get this thing called a group delay, and this tells me about how much delay is introduced into the system. What this means is, if I have a system or um, um, impulse response, h of n, and it has a frequency response, h of omega, and I pass a signal through it, and it has a group delay of, let's say, 5. That means that ultimately my data will be delayed by five units of time, right? And that's, and that's achieved if I only have like that linear characteristic. If it's nonlinear, bad things happen. That means, because this is a derivative across frequency, what that means, certain frequencies are going to be delayed more than others because it, doesn't, it is not linear. It's not a linearly increasing function. And what's the derivative of linear? It's going to be a constant value. If it's something wonky and it goes all over the place and you take the derivative, that means across frequency you have different delay elements, which means different parts of the filter are going to delay different parts of the input differently, and then it's just a mess. We don't want to deal with that. All right? Okay. So in terms of practical filters, I'm just going to touch upon a few. Okay. Ah, did I shoot over? Well, let's, where is it? Ah, yes. So I'm, I'm going to go back in a, in a second. But some of the practical filters that I want to bring up, and these are some pretty good ones, and they have like analog equivalents. Uh, there's things called notch filters, comb filters, and again, all-pass filter. All-pass filter, um, again, it's, it's, it's not a brick wall filter, and you can play around with the phase uh, very nicely. But uh, the notch filter... That's what you, you guys are going to be designing for open-ended problem, for your problem set. So what you need to do is design notch filters to knock out those sinusoidal tones. So notch filter, it like lets almost everything through, boom, except for two frequencies or one frequency, right? Um, comb filter is when you have multiple, multiple tones. So let's say I was really, really bad and I put six evenly spaced tones in that um, speech signal that I gave you guys. So let's say it's like, and you know, and it's like, okay guys, deal with it. What you'd use is a comb filter. You would have, a, you know, you would basically take out one, two, three, four, five, six signals, all, uh, all in one shot. And then the all pass, like what I mentioned before, if you're manipulating the phase response, usually you want to make something linear phase, because then it has a constant group delay. Okay, I'm going to go back to... So this guy here, we actually talked about him already, right? In the last lecture, we talked about um, the, the, the frequency response of a system, 
And if we have a rational frequency response that consists of poles and zeros, which are the roots of the rational numerator and denominator, like, you know, we have a polynomial for a numerator and a polynomial for the denominator, and we then find the roots of those polynomials, we get the poles and we get the zeros. In the denominator and the numerator, we get exactly this, right? There, there are a few things I did not talk about. And what are they? So let's go back to drawing. Drawing. OK. So let's make a really big Z plane. OK. One and one. And so first of all, what's, what's one of the things? Um, do we want to have the poles outside? No, right? Because what happens? So we know that we, we want to have essentially a stable, stable um, blah, uh, a stable system, right? So let's say that's our h of omega. So we know that these guys, first, th another observation is that whenever we do have complex poles, so we can have real poles. But if you have complex poles, they usually are complex conjugates. So they appear on either side of the x-axis. But what's interesting is, remember the, the definition, there are two things. There's causality, and there's stability. And this we learned from the z-transform stuff that we talked about a few lectures ago. And so we know that in order to be causal, So let's say we make this circle that goes through the two complex conjugate poles. What we need to have is we have to have the region of convergence go out to infinity, right? The other thing is, in order for it to be stable, it must include the unit circle. And this obviously does not satisfy that. So as a result, this is not going to do. We're going to have to have all the poles inside the unit circle. Even if it's complex conjugate poles, doesn't matter. They all have to be within the unit circle, because that way, the region of convergence in the z-plane extends to include the unit circle all the way to infinity. If you don't have that, then uh, it's not really a good situation there. All right? So I just wanted to graphically draw that. There's like a lot of words and stuff on the slide. so. Why, why read them off when you can actually draw it, right? So that's two observations. Aye. Okay. And then we talked about this before. And, and in fact, this is a way simpler example than the one I put down, way easier to draw as well. Um, what ends up happening is if you represent uh, your system, right, your h of z. So this is h of z. So we're going back to the z transform domain. How do I get to Fourier transform domain? Let z equals r e j omega, and then let r equal 1. So we're obser observing from the unit circle. And what you get at the end is, again, like, you know, the closer you get to a pole, the more your frequency response gets bigger. And the, and the closer you observe, like as you go around the unit circle, the closer you get to 0, the smaller your frequency response gets. So you, with this technique, if you use a single pole, you can create easily a low-pass filter or a high-pass filter just by putting the pole either close to, let's say, over here, right? Ah! Either at this end of the unit circle, so that when that locus is traversing around the unit circle, it's like, ah! My denominator is going to be really small, which means my frequency response is going to be really big. And hence, this big guy here, and then add pi or minus pi, whatever you choose, it's actually going to be really small, or vice versa. You can also play with conjugate poles, conjugate pair poles, and you'll get something that looks like this. Like in this case, it's really easy. This is at pi over 2 and minus pi over 2, and you get essentially peaks occurring there and nothing at... In fact, here, I'm intentionally putting zeros at 0 and pi on the unit circle, so I guarantee a 0 
frequency response at those places. All right? Uh, yeah, and then here's some potpourri. Like, you know, if you ever want to make um, a real, like, let's say you, you design a low-pass filter. Let's say it's for a class test, right? Or a quiz or a job. And it's like, okay, one minute left. Make a high-pass filter. What do you do? You take the coefficients, and then you just alternate them. One minus one, one minus one, one minus one. You just multiply it. So what you can do is essentially this. You take your low-pass filter and all the coefficients in the time domain, um, if it's FIR, and then what you do is you alternatively make it positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, and that will give you that response. And how did you get that? Because if you look at how the high-pass filter is derived from the low-pass filter, essentially it's you're rotating it by 180 degrees, right? So you're taking all the poles, all the zeros, and rotating it by pi. And if you think about that, OK, I'm rotating it by pi. How is that mathematically captured? Well, what ends up happening is let's extract that out right, of the time domain response. And you'll see that that's equal to e to the j pi. What's e to the j pi? Euler relation, right? It's cosine plus j sine. And what ends up happening is uh, you essentially have a plus or minus 1, depending on what n is equal to. Beautiful. So that's a quick way of making a high-pass filter from a low-pass filter. All right, so I talked about this. Now, this, this guy here is a little bit interesting because suppose you want to make an inverse system from, um, like, you know, so suppose you have x, you get y. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. But I didn't want to get y. I want x still. So you want to undo things, right? So how do you create the inverse filter to h of omega? And the answer is, so you notice how h of omega, especially if it's rational, it has this form of um, a bunch of polynomials in the numerator and a bunch of polynomials in the denominator. Oh, so polynomial in the numerator, polynomial in the denominator, and ta-da, that gives you h of omega. And notice how you have the product of x of omega with h of omega to give you y of omega. If, let's say, I come up with this magical hi of omega, that's the inverse, the opposite operation of h of omega to get back that x of omega. Essentially, what you're doing is you're flipping numerator and denominator in order to get that response. But you have to be careful, because if you do that, your regions of convergence now might or might not work, depending on where those zeros are, right? So there, there are a few caveats. But ultimately, if you go through the math, what you want is the inverse um, response multiplied with the original response to be equal to 1. You want this to be e We call this, we call this result, we call it an identity. We want this, the product of these two guys to give an identity response. And therefore, what it comes out to is your inverse will actually be what used to be your poles are now your zeros, and what are your zeros are now your poles. This is a problem. Remember I talked about, oh, I want to put a zero or several zeros on the unit circle. <gasps> That's super bad. What, because think about it. What used to be zeros now are poles on the, on the unit circle. Remember that I'm observing everything from the unit circle. So what happens if I'm traversing the unit circle and I land right in a pole now? It's going to blow up, right? Bad news. So we have to be very careful about regions of convergence when we do the inverse functions because it might blow up in our face. It might not be causal. It might not be stable. There are a lot of things that we've got to consider when we find the inverse of these things, right? Okay. All right. So the last thing that I want to talk about is also, so I mentioned linear phase and the importance of it. Because with linear phase, you have a filter that essentially has constant group delay ac across all frequencies, which is really great, which means that um, all frequencies of the information that's passing through that system are all going to be delayed by the same amount, as opposed to if you have a non-linear group delay, then things get very wonky, as I call it. There are three other terms out there that, that, that uh, are used with respect to phase, which is called minimum phase, maximum phase, and mixed phase. So minimum phase is when, if you observe the phase change from um, 0 to pi, 
frequency, the net is equal to zero. So basically, if I go from zero and I swoop across omega from zero to pi, the overall phase change as I go from zero to pi is zero. Essentially, let's say I have zero phase, and then I go from zero frequency to frequency equal to pi, omega equal to pi, and it's zero phase. That's minimum phase. Maximum phase is when I do the exact same thing and I get like a phase change of pi. Like that's big, right? Big phase change. And then last but not least, there's something called mixed phase. And that's, that's when we, we get a phase change that's not zero, between zero and pi uh, radians, but it's not, um, it's not pi either. It's somewhere in between. So it's not the maximum and it's not the minimum phase. It's somewhere in between the two. Okay. All right. So with that, um, that concludes lecture 11. Okay. So I did promise all you guys a break. So we'll start at 8. So